All right, I think we've got a we've got everything uh, kind of going right now. So I'll get the event started. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's Campus Connection event put on in partnership with DS3 and with participation from Kieran Analytics, Lytics, and Tandem Diabetes. My name is Jarrett Hartman, and I'm the University Talent Director for Tech San Diego. Before we jump into today's event, I'd uh, just like to say a couple things about Tech San Diego and today's panel. Uh, Tech San Diego is a nonprofit that works with small to mid-sized companies here in the San Diego region. My job as University Talent Director is to work with groups like DS3, plan events uh, like today's panel, and make sure students know about opportunities available in our local tech ecosystem, like internships and open job postings. We've got a number of resources on our website, techsd.org, uh, like a student COVID-19 resource page and a comprehensive regional tech directory so you can see who's hiring in the region. Uh, if you have any ideas for uh, events or topics that students might like to hear about on our podcast, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at jar ett.hartman at techsd.org, and we can go from there. Uh, I've worked closely with Ayush on this event, and I'm really excited to work with DS3 more uh, for events uh, throughout the summer and into next school year. Uh, for a few notes on today's panel, Ayush and his team have done a great job uh, to kind of break today's event into four main topics, uh, the first being career advice and job hunting, the second being kind of on the job, the third being tools and libraries, and the fourth being kind of general advice and words of wisdom. We've got a number of questions that we'll be going through in each of these topics, but if you have a question that we haven't discussed during the panel, feel free to send it in the chat. Uh, if we have time af after the end of the last topic, I'll open up the panel to questions. Uh, with that said, I'd like uh, I used to just say a few words about DS3, and then we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. Hello. Hi. Uh, so my name is Ayush. I am the head events director for DS3, which is the UCSD Data Science Student Society. And so our, so our organization. Our, 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 can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, you're you're good. Can, can you? Can you just turn down your internal speaker? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it was a feedback from another um, from another presenter. Possibly, or just yeah, if you could just turn down your intern internal speaker, it will turn off that echo. Okay, perfect. am I good? Yeah, I think so. Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah, again, like my name is Ayush. I'm the head events director for DS3, which is our UC San Diego Data Science Student Society. And so we are an interdisciplinary academic organization designed to immerse the community in the diverse and growing facets of data science. So our organization provides opportunities for students, such as working on hands-on personal projects, hosting professional development events like these and fun outreach events, as well as different events for all UCSD students, regardless of their major. Um, we have more of these types of events planned and we're especially thrilled to be working with uh, Tech San Diego in coordinating this event. And we have many other events coming later in the fall. So I would like to take the time to uh, thank all of my panelists for coming to this event and speaking up on helping out our students, especially in this difficult time. And so if you wanna be more updated with the types of events we have planned and, and any other coordinations with Tech San Diego, we'll be posting that on our website, on our Facebook page, and through other social media. Perfect, thank you, Ayush. Uh... And at this time, I'd like the panelists to kind of introduce uh, each other or introduce themselves. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Alexandra Constantin. Uh, she is from uh, Tandem Diabetes. She's the director of data science. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Constantin. I'm director of data science at Tandem Diabetes. Um, I lead the uh, data science and analytics team there. Um, Tandem um, has a, a flagship product that is an insulin pump um, uh, that connects to a continuous glucose monitoring sensor and has an algorithm that can um, give uh, that can adjust um, insulin delivery in, in real time. So. Um, my team works on um, al algorithms and models that can help make our products more personalized and easy to use, and also on um, helping the business make better, more informed decisions. Perfect. 
Uh, thank you very much, Alex. And next, uh, I'd like to hear from our guests at uh, Curan Analytics. Hi, um, my name is Aruna Rajshekar. I do apologize, even though the video icon is green on my screen, for some reason, I think you cannot see me. Um, nevertheless, I'm here, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm a senior manager on the analytics team of Kiran Analytics, which is uh, a part of a larger company called uh, Variant Systems. Um, this business unit, Kiran Analytics, is um, focused on offering workforce optimization solutions to retail banks. Um, on the analytics team, we have about 10 to 12 uh, team members. Uh, we do consulting um, for retail banks, um, any one of the large banks you can think of and you see as you drive home, um, as well as an R&D team that focuses on um, data science uh, R&D projects. Uh, two other panelists that we have today, Jim and uh, John, sorry, John and Jeff are on my team. And uh, hey guys, do you want to introduce yourself? John? Uh, yeah, go ahead, John. Okay. All right. Um, so my name is John Tsai. Um, as Rona speak, um, we I work for Kiran Analytics, uh, part of Baron Company now. Um, interesting facts: I actually got two master degree, both from UCSD. One very recent, and Stephanie, Paul, I don't know if you can recall, um, but I actually worked with you uh, on the live one of the library, <laughs> putting one, archiving one of our projects to it. Um, both are data science related. Uh, one is master of in business analytics and another one is data science engineering. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of connection, I guess, with UCSD in general. Um, and right now I'm an analytic consultant in Curran Analytics, uh, Analytics and I work mainly in the consultant part, but also as well in the R&D part that our, um, Aruna is mentioning. All right, go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Um, I'm Jeff Ernst. Um, I'm also an analytics consultant at Curran Analytics. Um, and I've worked there for two and a half, almost three years now. Um, and just like Aruna said, we work on uh, branch, uh, bank branch field study projects. Um, and I work mainly as an analyst, but I also do some automation and design work on our team. Um, and so, yeah, just like uh, John, this is, uh, I also got a master's degree, um, but it was at Cal Poly. And this is my first job out of school. And uh, interestingly enough, I also founded a data science club at Cal Poly, um, which I, I assume is very similar to uh, DS3 at, at UCSD. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. And it's good to hear that we've got a good UCSD data science uh, alum on the, on the panel as well. Now, I'd like to hear from Jesse Daniels from Lytix. Hey, hey, uh, how's it going, everybody? Uh, I'm Jesse. Um, yeah, I work for uh, Lytix. I'm a staff machine learning scientist at Lytix. Um, I've probably been at Lytix about, uh, at about, for about five years now, I would say. Um, so if you're not familiar with what Lytix does, uh, we're, I guess, considered a video telematics company. So what is that? Um, our primary product is uh, something called a drive cam. So it's like a, it's a, essentially, it's a, it's a ruggedized device that gets installed into like a cab of a vehicle. And it has a variety of sensors, including like video, uh, audio, gyroscope, accelerometer, uh, GPS. Like it's kind of like your phone, but it's like a more ruggedized version. And so we use that to basically identify uh, risky behaviors and risky scenarios while a driver is driving. Um, so whenever anything interesting happens, uh, it'll basically capture a video clip that gets sent back, and we use that to help coach the drivers um, on risky behaviors. And you know, ultimately make the roads a uh, more safe place. Um, so what do I do on the team? Uh, so I'm primarily working with uh, analyzing the video, kind of fusing these different sensors together to identify like distracting uh, behaviors, like using cell phone or not wearing a seatbelt, things that our clients would be interested in knowing about. Um, trying to do that in a more automated way. Um, and a lot of these algorithms, we have to kind of streamline and deploy these on these low-powered edge devices so that they can actually operate um, in the vehicle. Uh, so it's pretty interesting work. I do a lot of work with uh, video and, and like, fusing these real-time sensors together to get a picture of what's happening uh, during the drive. 
So I'm glad to be here. Great. Thank you very much, Jesse. It's good to hear from you. Yeah. And last but not least, we have Stephanie Lab Labou. It, forgive me if I uh, mispronounce your last name. That was right. <laughs> Um, yes. Hi, I'm Stephanie Labou. I work at UC San Diego. I am in the library. I am the librarian for data science. So I am the liaison between the library and the data science major on campus, but really all departments on campus who are doing something data science flavored. So I work with students a lot to develop projects and get access to certain data sets, um, especially there's a lot that's free out there, but there's a lot that we can provide access to that is not going to come up in something like a Google search. Um, and then as John mentioned, I also work with the master's programs on campus to better curate and preserve their projects. And so talking about data management best practices, how do you cite things, how do you organize your file structure to make it reusable and reproducible. Um, and I also got my undergrad at UC San Diego. So nice to be back. Even even better to have more representation on the panel there. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And I and I've got a feeling that we've got a whole section that you'll be able to really take take charge of. All right, so we're gonna just jump right into it. Uh, again, Ayush and his team did a great job of separating these questions into kind of four distinct sections. So I'm going to throw a question out there for uh, our panelists. Panelists, feel free to answer uh, as much as you want. You guys are going to be driving the conversation here. So I'll throw in questions as it kind of organically happens and we'll go from there. Uh, but kind of following up on the introduction, how did you get into the data science field? Were there any steps, maybe like an internship or research that you did that you took on during your undergraduate career that eventually led you to data science? Or was it kind of a hard pivot from another field? And we'll start with Jesse at Linux. Yeah, so I had a kind of interesting yeah, background. My, my undergrad is actually, and my uh, master's is in uh, operations research. So it's not directly data science, but a lot of the same uh, kind of underlying uh, statistics, optimization, that kind of thing. Um, but my first uh, kind of career, like getting into, into the workforce was uh, actually as a systems engineer. So I worked for a company uh, doing system engineering and along the way, I, I realized we had a lot of data available. And you know, whenever there's data available, there's kind of an opportunity there. And so I started kind of taking, uh, you know, took like an initiative to kind of start looking at that data and start building some some models. This is really something that wasn't really going on at my company. Um, and so I kind of built up my my skill set that way. So I really didn't start off in a data science field, but um, you know, given given the opportunity and the data that was available, I was able to kind of you know, uh, build something and, and um, yeah. So it was kind of kind of the way I did it. So I kind of came out of, uh, in a roundabout way. But I also say like the background as a system engineer also helps, you know, um, you know, with, with the data science work as well. So I understand the requirements, the business context, sort of how the product fits into the overall uh, business goals is useful. Great, well, what about you, Alex? Um, so I would say I, I pretty much was doing data science from um, well before it was a term um, and definitely before it was a popular term. Um, as an undergraduate, um, I always liked solving problems with algorithms. Um, so I had the opportunity to do some um, internships in robotics, natural language processing, um, and also do um, a senior thesis that was on brain computer interfaces, where um, I used algorithms to classify what someone was thinking, whether they were thinking of moving a mouse cursor left, right, up, or down, um, based on uh, these EEG signals that were captured from, from um, a person's brain waves. Um, so after that, I, I continued this, this type of research. Um, I got a PhD in uh, computer science from UC Berkeley, where I worked on medical images. And then um, pretty much throughout my career, I did data science um, until it became a popular term. Perfect. Uh, and what about our friends uh, from Kieran? Um, yeah, I'll go first. Um, yeah, I think like Alex mentioned, um, I started uh, working with large amounts of uh, data, you know, even before data science existed as a field. 
Um, this was during my grad school days. I, I was working on a PhD in astrophysics, so we had to deal with large uh, volumes of data and writing code and modeling physics equations, actually. Um, that's what that's how it started. And um, then in you know through the course of my um, professional career, I worked at other jobs where, I had to, uh, rather than building models, I was in the weeds looking at uh, data and, um, you know, ensuring data quality and uh, integrity, um, so to speak. So, um, you know, various uh, turns uh, in my career, but always been with, worked with data. Jeff? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I... Uh... I started as an undergrad in finance, and um, it was never quite what I imagined. It was the most quantitative field in the business school at uh, Cal Poly, but um, it just wasn't—it wasn't enough for me. And uh, I remember I was looking for an internship, and I found one at Clark's for a data science internship. And I looked at the requirements and what the role was like, and it looked like everything I had been looking for all this time. And um, the only thing that I was missing was learning R. And so I did all this research at school and found you have to be a stats minor to get into class. So I kind of went down this long path of doing a stats minor at my school. Um, I realized I still, I did the stats minor too late and I didn't have quite the experience to get into a data science, data analyst role right out of college. So just kind of by random chance, I ran into someone who was, starting the business analytics master's program at my school. And uh, in the meantime, I had started the data science club, which kind of gave me an edge getting into the program. And um, after once I did that program, uh, I was able to get the job at Caron Analytics. Um, and I really feel like the experience I had in business wasn't all wasted. I did a lot of presentations. There was a lot of domain experience I learned there that really helped me you know, get my job and be successful. Uh, now, John. I guess I will go next. Uh, all right. Let me. I guess let me turn my back webcam on. Um. So, um, my route is somewhat similar to Jesse. I guess. Um. I started off as a chemical engineer actually from my undergrad, uh, and I went into you know I went to Charlotte in the East Coast and worked for about two years, and I didn't really quite like it. <laughs> And it was at that, that time was the data, big data started blooming. And then I had a session with my dad talking about my future actually. And then he suggested, hey, why don't you take a look at the big data? And then I look at it I'm, and I'm like, yeah, well, why not give it a try? So I applied for, but then to switch a field, I feel like I need some sort of credential. So I applied for the master in business analytics um, at UCSD. Um, that's where I got my first master. And during this time, I kind of cultivated my interest in it. And then at, at the end, I ended up a job um, here as well in San Diego. Um, and after that, I, I developed more interest in this field. And then I feel like I want to learn more. So I actually went on to get a second master, which is the one that me and Stephanie had a connection with. And basically, this field is evolving every day. And I just want to keep up to the trend. So yeah, that's how I got to where I am today. And Stephanie, what, what drew you to the data science field? Um, my, my path is both a hard pivot from something completely different and on further thought, not that different. So my undergrad degree is in ecology and my master's is actually in marine science. Um, so I did a lot of, of field work and having the experience of being out in the field taught me that I really love data and sitting in front of a computer more than I like doing field work. Um, so I actually got a job as sort of the embedded data encoding person for a large research group at Washington State University. And so ecology and environmental science is really at this tipping point of getting to big data. So you've got remote sensing, right? You've got all your LIDAR data. There's global climate data. There's, you know, chemical data for um, lakes, oceans, and rivers. There's species counts. So it's reached that point where it is such a large amount of data that a lot of research groups need someone to keep track of it and handle it and manage it and code it and visualize it and preserve it. Um, and so that's what I did. And so I'm, I'm almost entirely self-taught in all the aspects of data science, but I think it was a really valuable way to learn it. So I kind of came from it at the, um, 
you know, applied, we didn't call it data science, it was just, we had a lot of data, and it wasn't until um, my grant funding kind of ran out there and I started looking for jobs that I realized that what I had been doing was really overlapping with data science. So I had all the coding skills and everything. Um, and so it, the, the, the key theme I think was that it's all data related, right? It's what you do with it, it's finding it and working with it. Um, but the domain background was kind of way far than what I would have expected, but it worked out really well because I worked really hands-on with data. So now I have this really deep appreciation for what it takes to do a good data science project in terms of everyone says garbage in, garbage out, and it's extremely true. So like that data piece is really, really important. So that's how I ended up here. And I think just from all of those answers alone, you can see that there's so many different paths uh, kind of in and into data science. How would you all recommend students get a wide range of experiences within data science to see which area they might like to pursue further? Uh, and if your company offers internships for data science students, do you make an effort to provide students with kind of a taste of different experiences, or do you have them really just dive deep into one particular project or team experience? Uh, why don't we start with, uh, why don't we start with uh, Kieran Analytics here? Um, okay, so uh, to answer the first part of your question, um, which is what would you recommend, right? Um, so personally, um, you know, just going from my own experience as well as uh, team members and you know people that I've hired or worked with um, the big thing is you know to have flexibility and an open mind um, to do various types of tasks and um, roles you know yeah to, to have an open mind to do various types of tasks or play different roles um, within the data science group um that helps a lot and you know one should be willing to uh, work just with data or do automation or work on um, you know visualization or um, you know build models so the thing that i have noticed a lot uh, when i talk to um, candidates or you know younger people who are looking out uh, looking for jobs or experience is that um, Many people want to build models, uh, but before you get there, there's a lot to learn, um, you know, by working with data itself, and that itself can be pretty, um, you know, rewarding and enriching. So um, to cut it short, I, I would say keep an open mind and be willing to do um, kind of different tasks within the data science team. Now, regarding internships, uh, what do we do at Kiran Analytics? Usually, um, when we hire uh, summer interns, uh, we, uh, we hire them keeping you know, some project in mind, so they are embedded in a project team. But within the project team, they do get opportunities to do different uh, tasks, work with data, participate in client meetings. We are, you know, we are a consulting team, so we work very closely with clients. Um, but some are interns are um, given the opportunity to participate in the client calls, sit in, observe, um, participate in design meetings, uh, work with the data, do analysis, and, and contribute to creating reports as well. So it kind of gives them an exposure to the various things that we do um, in the typical you know, role or a job um, in our company. Great. Yeah. John, do you have what, anything to add? Sorry. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so Aruna already addressed many good points, so I won't add on to that already. But just based on my personal experience and kind of address um, the Jared's other question on whether you should focus on one area or try out different multiple areas. I think it's beneficial for both. I personally tried out multiple areas. Uh, throughout my first master, I participated in three different R&D group research. Um, I worked with three different professors during uh, in the span of one year. I worked on three different R&D, and they all worked on very different projects, uh, different types of data. Um, but honestly, you know, data, different types of data, but algorithm you can apply to it, like it's usually the same. Um, so I was, I would say I prefer to work on separate data. 
um, just because it gives you a little more variety in terms of experience and everything. Um, and in fact, that's actually how I got my job through one of professor, professor who's uh, actually connected to Quran Analytics. That's where I actually landed my job here. Um, and I also add on to a point, yeah, but maybe this is for later section, but yeah, like building model to my personal opinion, I think it's overrated in the sense that people emphasize it a little too much, but didn't pay importance to visualization and other aspects, data engineering and things like that. But once you were working in the actual field, you'll realize those are equally important, like garbage in, garbage out. So that those are transforming data into something that's useful. But yeah, that's just my personal experience here. Um, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to take a little different take on, on this. Um, so I, I feel sort of um, lucky that I was I actually started in business and finance and I had some experience there and I could transition over. So I wasn't just doing data science the entire time and I, and I had a better idea of what I wanted to do. But, um, you know, some people aren't that lucky and, and maybe you get an internship and you don't, you don't know what it's going to be like and, and you get to the company and, and they're not offering a lot to do. You know, you're stuck in some very specific project and you don't really have the chance to, to see all these different aspects of data science and, and data oriented fields. Um, but I, I think the one thing you can do, even if you're limited by all that, is data is, it's the entire field. It, there's not a lot of barrier to entry. You go into other fields and, and if you're stuck in a job, you may not be able to even see what it's like on the other side. But with most data oriented fields, you can go online, you can learn things on your own, you can learn about the field, you can have actual experience with it in your own projects. Um, and I think one thing that I've done at Kiran Analytics is, you know, I can go to work and, and work on my project and that's it. But there's a lot of stuff you can do to be proactive, looking for process improvement, talking to other team members, you know, and we have a, we have a development team and I think just talking to them and, and seeing what their role is like and where, where we kind of fit in. Um, and so I think it, in a way it's sort of up to you to, figure that out and you have to be proactive and, and reach out to other people working on different things to figure out really what, what you want to end up doing. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, what, what about you, Alex? Um, so uh, to, to me, one of the most um, important things in data science is to be able to solve a problem with data. So I think a, a way to really learn the different aspects of data science is to just try to solve a problem from beginning to end and just get exposed to, to everything. And it doesn't have to be a large problem, but just understanding how you get from a pain point or a user need to something more specific that's a, a technical project you can, you can do with the data to actually address that user need, and then communicating your results and working cross-functionally to uh, turn that into a real solution. So um, what, when we have summer interns, we try to um, expose them to that, even if it's a smaller uh, problem that gets solved in, in 10 weeks, it's not something uh, that's a, a year long project. I think it's really important that they see it from beginning to end. Um, the, the other thing I, I would say about different career paths is um, I don't think you'll be, um, fully exposed to the different aspects of data science in one internship. So during undergrad, it's good to have different internships, different experiences, but then um, get a job, any job in data science um, and work with other people across the, the full data science spectrum. Offer to help on the project, um, ask people what they're doing, try to learn from them. And I think that's also, uh, in addition to getting good exposure, it's also a good way to find mentors and people who are further along in, in their career. Um, and the, the last um, thing I'll say is that um, this is a highly personal choice. So there's some um, soul searching to be done there and some self-discovery on what are the actual things that motivate you. Um, what are the type of activities that uh, you lose track of time uh, doing? And just really um, seek to understand from those experiences what it is that you love um, to, to be able to focus more afterwards. Great. And 
Uh, Stephanie, I'm not forgetting you. I, I want you to kind of uh, bat first on this next question, uh, but it's for the entire panel. With many internships canceled uh, during the summer due to the pandemic, do you have any suggestions for students on how to stay productive over the summer, uh, it, whether that be a project or searching for internships? What, what's kind of your guys' perspective on that? Um, I will say Alex kind of took my usual spiel that I tell to students pretty much verbatim um, in terms of doing a project from start to finish is incredibly valuable. And so um, I know that a lot of internships have been canceled. Um, it sucks, right? It's a it's a really weird it's a really weird time. Um, and I know no one necessarily likes the answer, but just because you don't have an internship doesn't mean you can't take on some sort of project, right? So if you were going to have an internship and you were going to work um, in a healthcare field and you were going to work on generally X, Y, and Z, um, there's nothing to say you can't adapt that to your own project. You will learn so much in terms of um, you're going to have to find the data. No one's going to hand it to you, right? Some sort of problem. You will get experience with all aspects of the data life cycle. And it is incredibly valuable because I think one of the best things that you can learn that will take you really far is um, adaptability and resilience. And so you are going to reach a point in an internship or a project where you don't know how to do something. That's fine. That's incredibly common, in fact. But can you go find that answer? Can you implement it, right? If you don't know how to use a certain package, can you go learn how to use it? Um, and so I think that's a really good way to, to stay productive. Um, since I know that's broad and nebulous, Another way I like to think of it as pick one aspect, right? So maybe you really decide that your passion is working with, I don't know, APIs, right? So a project that is API based, or if you decide you are really, really into modeling, great, pick something complicated. And at the end of the summer, you will have learned if that is something that you can really focus on for 10 weeks. And now imagine doing that for 30 years. So are you really passionate about statistical error and you're really into fine tuning models, or is that something that sounds really interesting, but then in practice, it turns out that what you really enjoy is interactive visualization, right? Or you really enjoy converting technical information to a blog post. And so it's a really good way to use this time as kind of a period of self-reflection and figure out within this really broad umbrella of data science, there are things that are buzzy, and there are things that you are realistically going to be passionate about enough to, to dig in and work through. And so if you have that kind of self, self drive to work on something over the summer, that's a really good way to figure out, turns out I can't stand right all this like data cleaning, but I really love digging into, um, I don't know, the, the modeling part of natural language processing, but I, I really hate going through like dirty OCR text, right? Um, or I really have a passion for working with a certain type of data, video, audio, or I'm really interested in a domain. And so this can be a good time to figure out of this giant nebulous thing of data science, what you might wanna narrow into. So next time when you're searching for internships or jobs, you've gained some skills and you've figured out kind of like what, what you are most interested in, in working on. And I'll give my spiel about how the library can help later, but if you're a student at UC San Diego, like that's my job. Um, so I'll let someone else talk now. Uh, go ahead, Alex. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, yep. So I, I would echo the same thing. F find the problem to work on. Um, I know usually it's, it's harder to find what that problem is than it is to actually solve it. And for anyone who's, who's been through a PhD program, they, they would know that those first few years when you try to land on the right problem are probably the most difficult. Um, but anything you might be interested in where, where there's data available and um, you can learn something, I think is a really useful experience. Um, or beyond that, just generally learning more. There are so many um, open source courses and lots of information on data science right now. So I think there are lots of ways to be productive. And as if you have goals or something you'd like to achieve at, at the end of the summer, um, that there are definitely ways to position yourself for a good internship next year or for the, the next step you want to take after that. 
Great, thank thank you. Uh, and Jesse, what about you? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I definitely agree with what everybody's been saying so far. I think the whole process of going from end to end, starting with kind of a messy data set all the way through kind of model development and kind of um, like solving some sort of business problem, I think is incredibly important. Um, I think in terms of like, just from a technical point of view, like trying to uh, hone your technical skills, um, I think maybe trying to find like an open source uh, project like, uh, you know, TensorFlow or some some of these uh, open source libraries and trying to uh, contribute to those, I think would be really interesting. Um, and also just like maybe trying to find an interesting paper and try to implement uh, some aspects of that. Those have been really uh, things that I've, I've done that I've, I've feel like I've really benefited, benefited from uh, technically. But but yeah, I think uh, trying to find really cool open source data sets like, you know, I know the, the city of San Diego has a bunch of cool uh, data sets that are open. Um, but yeah, trying to find that problem and kind of working it through end to end, that would actually be really impressive if I saw a candidate uh, with that kind of background and, and initiative and creativity. Great. And uh, what about uh, our group from Karen? Go ahead. No, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think you guys pretty much covered it all. Um, the only thing I wanted to add is that uh, you know employers are are just like anyone else. You know, I, they're uh, they're just looking for someone who's a good teammate. So um, you know, something to anything to really improve you as a person. Who would you want on your team? You know, that that's kind of the way I think about it. Is who would you want on your team? What skills would they have? Um, and one way to do that is, is to look online, look at uh, job descriptions, see what's missing, you know, like look at the requirements, see what you're missing in your resume and your profile and try to fill that in. I mean, even if you don't find the, the most interesting problem, um, just find something you're interested in and start working. Um, use different tools that you're not familiar with. Uh, take some initiative. Those are the type of people that uh, employers want on their team. So. Can I actually ask a question to the rest of the panel? This this is related, and this is a conversation I have with students um, a lot in terms of learning those new skills and then getting panicked students who say, like, you know, it's, it's an internship and they want five years of TensorFlow or five years of a package that was developed like two years ago. Um, in terms of how to 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 sell their skills. And so are our employers going to be impressed by a laundry list of very fancy Python packages that realistically are one line of code and aren't that hard? Or are they going to be more impressed? And you can impress upon them this, because I don't think that I always have the the high moral ground to, to say this to students because I'm not actually a data scientist, but or would they be more impressed with a small, well-defined project that shows that creativity and as opposed to like a laundry list of I can, you know, do deep learning and I can use TensorFlow and Keras and things like that? I, I'd love to answer that. Um, this is just my perspective, but uh, I think <laughs> I think the employers are looking for a good story. So just like anyone else, everyone loves a good story. So, um, you know, it's great to have a bunch of packages on your resume. Um, I personally, that, that's not very impressive to me, but um, you know, it's great that you know that. I, I think what's really interesting is implementing it, because that's what you're doing in a job, right? So um, I, I think giving them a good way that, you know, I have this problem and I tried these different solutions, they didn't work. I tried this package and I finally figured it out and I have this product and, and here's what it can do. That's what we're really looking for because when you're working, <laughs> you're not, expected to know everything you're supposed to learn and and have critical thinking learn what you need be resourceful so i think if you can demonstrate that in a resume and especially in an interview and tell a good story um, a potential employer would be very impressed and i just want to add on to that um while to answer stephanie's question earlier um a list versus an actual project i think it has to be i'm leaning towards again project because like Jeff said uh, I think people are looking for a good story how can you make their company beneficial and how can they work with you you know so a tangible project that can demonstrate from start to end like Alex said start to end you solve a question start to end 
that's going to be more useful than say having 10 different credentials on your resume but with that being said though um you should still keep in mind what's the rec prerequisite that they your employer is putting on there because you had to get an interview first before you can get to talk to them right so you have to be prepared that at least things on their prerequisite you don't have to know everything but at least you, you're aware of these things right and if you can satisfy as many as you can that would be great um prepare for the interview but yeah, to get that interview you probably need something that can grab their eyes and project by the way is a very good thing to grab their attention too um but i would say well, it has to be a mixture of both you can't just focus on one thing and not totally neglect the other yeah yes jesse i'll just add on a little bit too i, I also agree 100 percent um i think it's a little bit of both um and i think it also depends if you're talking about internship versus like you know full-time long-term employment I think for internship uh, opportunities, I would I would look for someone who does have some of that technical background as well, because if you if we work heavily with like say TensorFlow and you don't have any background with TensorFlow, it's a very that's a, it's a high learning curve kind of uh, framework. So I would look for someone with some of that background so they can kind of get uh, hit the ground running. We don't have to spend too much time uh, getting them up to, up to speed, at least for an internship, right? So very uh, small defined amount of time. But for longer term. Uh, you know, candidates, I definitely look, yeah, for more for potential. Okay, are you a good problem solver? You can always pick up the tools um, over time. But um, yeah, I, I do agree it's a mix of both, um, 100%. Yep, I, I also um, look for, for a good project and a good story and, and resumes. Um, I don't look so much for particular um, tools but uh, there are some prerequisites like um, being able to show that you're good at programming um, or that you've been in a software engineering project um, that you know um, th this baseline math, math and statistics that you're going to need to actually understand how to apply these methods and when they're appropriate and when they're not um, so th those are kind of the, the baseline. And after that, um, I think there are a lot of candidates who come in having applied models. And um, a lot of people for whom, um, especially deep learning these days, is, is a hammer and everything is a nail. Um, so I'm, I'm really cautious when that happens because I want to see someone um, who understood why they were using that method and what problem they were trying to solve and whether after applying their model they actually achieved that or not um, and I, I often i look for soft skills um, having a learning mindset because uh, you'll never know every tool out there there are several new ones that that show up every few months um, so just just being able to learn uh, whatever is needed for for the problem at hand and also looking for uh, ways to continuously improve, which is very hard to screen in, in a resume, but I think is very important. Great, thank you everybody. And thank you, Stephanie, for throwing that, that out there for the, for the panel. If any of the other panelists have questions like that, feel free to just jump in and throw them in uh, as you think of them. Uh, we're going to switch to the second topic here. It's going to be uh, on the job focus. So uh, the first question is, what makes a good data scientist? And what aspects of being a data scientist do you think are often overlooked? Uh, and we'll start with Jesse on this one. Yeah, I think we've covered uh, quite, a, quite a few of the aspects I would think are critical to data science um, already, but I, I really think that whole end-to-end -end kind of mindset is, is super important. So understanding what business problem are you trying to solve? Um, you know, are you, are you applying the appropriate evaluation metrics of your models to make sure that, you know, your solution is good and it actually solves the business problem? Um, and being able to kind of communicate with the with the business uh, consumers on, on on your model, its performance, its weaknesses, um, that kind of thing. Um, but I think, yeah, as far as like things that get overlooked, and I think we've kind of touched on this already, but getting good data is extremely difficult. Um, and I think we spend a lot of time, uh, at least in my company, uh, curating data sets. Um, that, that's actually a large portion of our of our work. The modeling part is actually fairly straightforward once you have good data. And as a matter of fact, the better your data is. The less sophisticated your models need to be to actually achieve decent performance. So, I think just really the the focus on on curating good data is I, I'm not sure if it's overlooked, but uh, it's it's incredibly important. And 
we've also seen uh, you know a lot of uh, sort of some of the newer candidates they they really want to focus on the modeling piece uh, which is fun but again there, there's a lot more to it but i think really that that sort of end to end perspective is is really critical um, without that you're you're not going to be very effective you know you're you're trying to solve a business problem at the end, at the end of the day so you always have to keep that in mind great thank you and uh, Alex, we'll hear from you next. Is, is there anything that we've missed so far? Or do you think that there's a, a point that often goes overlooked for data scientists or new data scientists looking to enter the field? Well, so I think it's really easy to focus on the technical skills, especially because there are so many that you need be between the, the programming and software engineering and all the, the different sides of math and algorithms. Um, but I, I think some things that people sometimes overlook are um, those soft skills. So the, the ability to learn, um, to communicate technical concepts, to lay audiences, to be able to actually turn the data analysis into a set of actionable next steps or recommendations for people who are not um, as, as good at consuming data or even con consuming the outputs of data. Um, and then cr critical thinking skills, being able to, to solve these problems systematically and to actually see what the problem really is. Because when a, a stakeholder comes to you with a problem, um, it's usually not what they actually need. Um, it's something that they've um, gone through a thought process and narrowed down um, a lot so that if you want to find an innovative solution, you might be solving the right problem if you give them exactly what they ask for. But if you communicate well up front, you might understand why they're asking for that and be able to come up with um, a, a more innovative solution that solves the problem better. And this was actually going to be one of the next questions, but I'll throw it out there and panelists can kind of answer as as you see fit. But how often, uh, if at all, do you personally work with clients and what challenges do you face when you're trying to articulate the more technical aspects of your job to people without as much technical knowledge? Okay, I can take a crack at that. Um, so a portion of our analytics uh, team is actually a consulting team. So we work with clients a lot. Um, and um, we are constantly communicating um, back and forth. And very often uh, we are discussing data issues with them, trying to get them to understand uh, the issues and resolve the issues for us um, if the data is coming from them. And, and also at the end of the project, we have to present all the results and um, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, so um, we talk to people with, at, at different levels and um, we have to cater to these different levels. So we uh, adapt to that. And uh, sometimes it's done through spreadsheets and sometimes it's done through um, PowerPoint presentations and sometimes it's done through um, a demo of our tools and we walk them through that. Um, it, it's, it's a mixture of all these things, but um, the success lies in understanding the audience and the needs of the audience. Um, sometimes it just uh, goes to, you know, using a whiteboard if necessary and using a spreadsheet and putting up some numbers and explaining um, things to them. So, um, and I don't know if I answered your question. Did I? That, that's okay. You you did you did touch on on the question, so you're all good. You're all good there. But okay. really, the heart of the question is, you know, how how uh, do you have any difficulties, or are there any particular challenges of just working with people that are not as technical as you are, and kind of communicating uh, what your projects or your your results are to them? Uh, and that's open to the rest of the panel. Um, uh, does anybody else from Karen want to chime in, or? Uh, I'd love to hear from Alex or Jesse again on that point. Sure. Um, I just want to share this one thing that I learned throughout, because I've been through multiple panelists as an as an audience um, throughout multiple programs. I found one thing in common from all the speakers, as well as my professor from my master. The idea is that 
you when you are and by the way this is related to the last question as well when you are a data scientist a successful data scientist treat themselves like a salesman um you think you're doing all the mathematical skills and everything but what's more important is how do you convey these messages how do you convince your business stakeholder to trust to the data that you use or solution that you provided and in 90 percent of the time this they uh, these business decision maker they don't have the technical background like you do right um in fact one of my professor once mentioned that there should be a cao i think uh, chief scientist chief data scientist uh, instead of ceo because there's always a disconnect between what data scientists provide to what the, the business decision maker slash the you know the clients want or so how do you convey that message to them so to aruna's question you have to kind of tailor towards it and you can never get out of the soft skill of communicating not technical to technical um so there is a lot of difficulties in there and i think to solve these difficulties solve this disconnect is to again that i'm sure the sensor has been repeated many times but you have to really understand what the client need before they even speak like a salesman a successful salesman they know they read their client mind they know what a client in need and when a client say no to something they wouldn't they they don't ask client why they 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 would test it out and then they would figure it out before the client even ask so that's what kind of the position that you have to put yourself into yeah. just wanted to add uh, one other thing especially from the current perspective um also re-emphasizing uh, John's point that uh, you know it's it's a true skill to take technical technical data and and boil it down. I actually think it takes more work to than to actually create the results, but actually make them translatable. Um, but one one pitfall that I end up a lot of times is I have a tendency to over automate things and kind of make things really standardized. Um, but the truth is that every client is unique. And you have to cater the way that you're communicating. You know, one one size does not fit all, especially in consulting. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I have to take a step back away from all the automating I'm doing and really think about what this client actually wants. You know, maybe scrap the template completely. Maybe they want a whole different presentation, a whole different way to present it. So you kind of have to be constantly thinking on your feet to be able to present the most effectively um, to each client. And I just want to chime in and say, completely agree with um, you know meeting the client where they're at. But I want to emphasize too that the discussion of you know soft skills and communication, it's a learned skill. It's something that you do have to practice. And so just like you practice coding and you practice modeling, it's something that you will have to practice. It's not you're a good communicator or you're a bad communicator, it is a learned skill. And so for every time you're you're practicing, you know, some sort of model or some sort of package or some sort of library, you should also be practicing how to convert that technical knowledge into something for a lay audience or a business-minded audience. And so if you're you're thinking about that when you're taking on projects, whether they're um, you know, personal projects or internships, even if it's not part of it, thinking how you would explain this to different audiences, because it really is something that does take a lot of practice to be an effective communicator, especially when something is extremely complicated and you're talking to an audience who really just wants to know, should I do this? Should I make this business decision? Should I make this change to my website? Can this car self-drive? Does this model predict correctly? And so it's, it's a lot of practice. And so I just wanna give a plug for, um, for every time you're practicing your coding, absolutely practicing, presenting, and discussing to both your peers and others, both verbally, written, and visually. Yep, and Stephanie, I think there are a few really common pitfalls for when you get started doing this, when you're a really technical person and you're just um, communicating or trying to, to sell for the first time. And um, it, it's always very helpful to think, what do I want to uh, the, the audience to conclude when they leave this meeting? What um, actions do I want them to take? Um, because it's, it's really easy to describe your project and start listing everything you did um, down to the very small details because you know you spend 
six weeks doing that data pre-processing because the data was really messy and everything was really hard. But if it doesn't help lead to the action and to the conclusion, it doesn't really matter that that was 80% of your time. Um, you just want every piece of information you give to be uh, building proof towards um, the, the right course of action. And, and the other thing that's really easy when you've worked on the project for a long time or in a field for a long time is to have that, that curse of knowledge bias where you assume that your audience has the context to understand what you're trying to say. And especially when you have five or 10 minutes to describe a really long, complicated project, it's hard to bring all that context in. So it's, it's a skill, uh, be, being concise is a skill that definitely takes a lot of practice. Um, go ahead, Jesse, if you had a point. Yeah, I was just gonna add a couple extra points to this one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I definitely agree. At Lytics, we have this thing called core care do, and it's it's basically that. It's you know why should the audience care about what you're talking, you know what you're saying, what you're presenting. Um, so it's a, it's a whole process and trying to get to the point and why why should the audience care about about what you're saying? It's very critical. Some of the like pain points that I know we run into, and a lot of our uh, clients uh, in quotes um, for my team in particular our internal uh, stakeholders. But a lot of things that we kind of get into discussions about that are get kind of stickier, like how, you know, how do you explain evaluation metrics in a way that makes sense to the business? So if you're presenting, you know, precision recall numbers or, you know, some accuracy numbers, like how, how do you translate that into something that they can understand? So a lot of times there's a lot of back and forth on that and like, oh, what does that mean again? So being really crisp on those definitions and kind of having uh, examples really help with that kind of thing. Another thing that we get into a lot of discussion on are model errors, like why did the model get this wrong? Um, and so a lot, a lot of times there's really not a great, a great way to uh, answer that question, uh, um, but we, we get those kind of uh, those issues quite a lot. And, and so sometimes we have to really kind of dig into that and kind of make, uh, give some kind of uh, intu intuition for what the model's doing and why it might've made that mistake. Um, other things uh, that we kind of talk a lot about are like, what, what are the requirements for like a minimal viable product? A lot of times our team and maybe you know technical people in, in general, we have a pretty high bar for like the performance we want our uh, products to, to exhibit. Um, but a lot of times the business is actually very happy with a lot less than what you think they would be. So it's like, we, we come in with a certain performance numbers and they say, well, or, you know, we're like, yeah, we, we can do better than that. But then they're like, wow, this is great. Like, what are, what are you talking about? So um, that's actually happened a couple of times and it's actually surprised us a bit. Like, so maybe the expectations are a little bit, a little bit different. Um, yeah. Anyway, those are those are some of the kind of more difficult kind of conversations we we typically have with the the stakeholders. Thank you very I, much. I just, oh, yeah, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add one more point. Um, coming off of especially what Stephanie said, um, where you have to practice, um, and I just. Wanted to add that you know data is you know if you're doing data analysis it's something that you can very easily do just at your computer all day long but um, when you're when you're practicing your soft skills especially presenting it's something you need to do in person at, at the you know it, it's good to do it by yourself but you also need to be doing it with other people so you know find your roommate or find a teammate or you know find someone who has no idea what the, what you're working on and try to explain to them. See if they see if they understand. Um, you know, if they can understand, then you've done a really. I mean, there's some context there, and nuance with the when you're talking to a client or presenting it in the context of that. But I think there is still some value um, being able to explain it at such a simple level that even a fifth grader can understand. Um, so. And to just add one quick point to that, I once talked to a manager at a very uh, well-known company. I'm not going to mention a name. And he said the one question that you always ask to his interviewers is, how would you describe a linear Y equals MX plus B model to a supermarket cashier? That's one interview question that you always get at a very big company. I, I don't want to mention the company name, but yes, that's kind of question that they actually ask. Thank you very much, everybody. And, and the panelists wouldn't know this, but maybe some of the DS3 students that were at uh, one of our previous events uh, would know it, but one of the one of the most asked questions that we got from DS3 uh, from for one of our previous events was, 
all about soft skills. So I'm glad that we got to spend a lot of time talking about soft skills and kind of their importance and how to kind of uh, work on uh, developing your, your comfort using those soft skills. So thank you very much, all of our panelists. We're gonna go on to the third section here, tools and libraries. And I'm gonna let Stephanie uh, kind of run wild with this for a few minutes. But the kind of, uh, what the we wanted to know is what skills and software are actually used in industry? Uh, what are some skills undergrads can spend their summer learning to get a head start? And this one is specifically for Stephanie, but how can data science students use uh, their the, the library this summer to kind of work on their projects? Um, I'll leave the specific questions about like what what packages for people actually in industry. Yep. um should be using i mean learn python learn r if you want to get crazy and learn something else um i think it's great to have 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 both because if you can pick up one it just shows that like you're really flexible um so for the library so first of all hello it is it is literally my job to be a resource so if you're a uc san diego student or affiliate um i can help you um what we just talked about if you want to try pitching someone pitch me your project, explain me your project. I can be a good like mid-level audience. So somewhere between a fifth grader and um, an actual data scientist. So like your, your general audience who knows enough to be interested. Um, I can be, if you want someone to be extra tough, I can. I, I know actually a lot about stats enough to rip it apart if you want me to. Um, or I can be a cheerleader if that's what you want. Um, from the library, a lot of what we can do is really data access. So both things that you are not going to find on Google and everything that resides in my brain. So if you say, I'm looking for, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to use real world examples, but I don't want to like, you know, use two real world examples from people that use like, I'm looking for videos about this very specific thing. Cool. I can help you find that. Um, as a librarian my job is to dig up data and find information so if you need the you know i want wheat import exports globally for the past 50 years i can get you that right um if you want 10,000 yelp reviews i can get you that that one's actually pretty common and super easy to find but things like that so things that you either can't find on your own because it's buried or stuff that um you can't get but the library has purchased so if you would like the entire fire hose for Twitter, I can get you that. We will sit down and have a long conversation about what you can and cannot do with it so that we don't get sued, but I can get you that. Same for Instagram, Facebook public, and WeChat before um, they cut off our access. Um, we can get, we have subscriptions to all these things. So um, if you want to skip kind of the data aggregation sets and you want to work with, I don't know, census data, don't use the census website, it's atrocious. We have another application that has formatted everything into a much easier tabular format. Go nuts, right? Um, so really data access. And then um, if you do want to use some specialized computing, we have remote access. So the library is closed. Remote access to the computers in the data NGIS lab. So um, if your laptop is crashing and you can't get access to some sort of cloud computing, um, we have a computer with 256 gigabytes of RAM, so you can use that remotely. Um, and then we also have some specialty software, so geospatial qualitative analysis. Um, you can all download and use Jupyter Notebooks on your own. But if you are want like really niche software that you want to mess around with, um, we can provide access to that as well. And then if you just want to bounce ideas around or come up with a project, you can make an appointment with me. We will chit chat, bounce ideas around, and help you kind of narrow down what it is that you're looking for. Um, and I can also recommend about a thousand listservs that you should be on that are weekly newsletters that are updates about data science in government, industry, and academia. And that's what I have to contribute. There we go, perfect. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And I'm gonna throw it to, uh, uh, actually, you know, I have one more question for you, Stephanie. Do you have any recommendations for good uh, free or low cost platforms to learn uh, programming languages or technologies over the summer? Or is that something that you should just kind of um, approach do you mean like, and... Yeah, so I mean, if you mean you wanna learn new languages, um, I almost forgot to have a plug. As of now, we have every O'Reilly book for free if you are a student. So if you wanted to read one of those O'Reilly machine learning books, do not buy it, send me an email and I will send you the link because it's not fully um, public yet. 
Um, for, for platforms, um, I will say, I think learning a second language is really useful. Um, I'm biased. I like R because it's very popular for like hardcore stats doing models. Um, and as an additional plug, I think that now, if you haven't, now is a time to learn some sort of GIS software. Um, a lot of data science can have a geospatial component. And so now is a good time to start learning concepts um, like interpolation and Krieging and how do you work with that. And we have um, access to all the ArcGIS and Esri products, including their Jupyter notebooks. So if you're looking for an extra thing to learn, either looking at an extra language like R, um, just because it'll, it's good practice in terms of learning a new syntax that is just similar enough that you know what you're doing, but it indexes from a different number, so it's, and the syntax is slightly different. Um, and then geospatial, I think, is really, really valuable for a lot of, of data science. So learning either QGIS, learning how to do geospatial things in R or Python, or learning how to use ArcGIS. And we have a GIS librarian too, and she's fantastic. Perfect, thank you very much. And, and I'm gonna throw it to, to kind of our industry people here. Anything that you guys would like to add to Stephanie's answer? Are there any particular skills or software that you would like to emphasize to the, to the students to know or to, to set out to learn? Um, one thing that I think people always overlook is SQL because <laughs> um, you're so busy building model all the time and then at the end, I, at least when I came out of my first master's, I don't know too much things about SQL and then, at, and then I learned the importance of SQL and then I actually took on many courses on that and by SQL, I, didn't, I don't mean just the simple queries, I'm talking about like how to efficiently query something. If you can query something in 10 seconds, can you make it five seconds? Can you make it two seconds? That's actually incredibly important um, later on as you go on to the actual industry world where time is very sensitive. And so that was one thing I would totally recommend to people. Yeah. Yeah, just to jump onto that, <clears throat> I would also recommend looking into like visualization type frameworks. Um, so I know with R, you have the ggplot kind of um, suite of tools. Those are really cool. I also have an R background as well. I actually tend to like that a little bit better than the Python side of things. On the Python side, we uh, typically standardize on like Plotly is one that we use quite a bit. Um, it's very, very handy, Get, have nice uh, interactive visuals. And those actually help a lot with uh, trying to explain things and present things. Um, in terms of tool sets, yeah, I mean, it's probably a lot of the standard things. I also, yeah, I was thinking SQL as well. You have to be able to get to the data where it lives. Um, and a lot of times uh, we also use like big data stuff. So like, uh, you know, be able to use like things like Spark or, uh, you know, Hive queries to access things that are that are stored in Hadoop is also uh, helpful um, if you wanna be more self-sufficient. Um, yeah, I mean, and then just kind of the software side of things, like we do a lot of stuff with Python. You know, we use uh, like Git as our, as our code, uh, um, repository uh, management, uh, Pandas, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the standardized tools. But those are all definitely used every single day. <laughs> Great, I, I, anything uh, that you'd like to add, Alex? Um, so same as everyone else, Python, R, SQL, uh, these are definitely things we use a lot. Um, we, we use R for all the advanced statistics, like when you absolutely have to do beta regression and it's, it's not available anywhere else. Um, we also use MATLAB sometimes because it has some signal processing things that um, the, the other more um, po popular libraries don't have. Um, and at, up until a few years ago, um, a lot of job applicants didn't have much big data experience, but that's starting to change. Um, so having a little experience with something like Spark or um, anything that you do in, in AWS, GCP, or, or Azure, um, I think that that would be a plus. Great, thank you very much, everybody. And we're gonna go on to the, to the final, uh, final category which is just words of wisdom i don't have any uh questions for this particular uh for this particular section and we've covered a lot of information in the panel so far but if there's any additional advice that you have for you know either the job search or just 
developing projects. Uh, any advice that you have for the students, I'm sure they would love to hear it at this point. So, uh, you know, why don't we start with you again, uh, Alex? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, kind of back to back you here. Um, yep, I, I would say um, be intentional in your decisions and explorations. Um, I think learning um, what you're passionate about and actually this discovering that you might not land on it initially is so important because we spend most of our times at work. Um, and when you find something that um, you can happily spend all of your time on and be really engaged in, um, it really makes a huge difference. So um, tr try to explore different paths, try to learn about yourself in, in the process. And when you do find that one area where um, everything fits into place, you, you just know it and you, you're gonna end up being a lot happier at work. Great, thank you. And, and Jesse, uh, why don't you go next? I definitely to add on to that. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, it's, it's just important to get your hands dirty, dig in and just try stuff. Um, I think that's, you're going to learn the most just just by doing. Um, and I would say, you know, it also helps in a way to kind of have some um, affinity towards the domain that you're working in. So I, I, I think that's actually very, if you're kind of working in, uh, towards solving interesting problems, I think you're just going to yeah, enjoy your work that much more. So I'd say, you know, try different kind of domains, try looking at different uh, kind of data sets, work with a variety of different kinds of data, yeah, geospatial data, text data, you know, imagery, video, you know, just trying working with different uh, different kinds of data. And, and you, you may find that you enjoy working with certain things more than others. But yeah, I'd say just, you know, I don't think you can go wrong in the beginning, just, just start trying. And no matter what kind of job you end up with, you know, maybe it's not a direct data science job, but if there's data available, there's opportunities um, to, to try things and, and kind of gain experience. Thanks, Jesse. And uh, what about our guests from, from Karen? Uh, love to hear from you guys now. Yeah, um, so yeah, just um, adding on to what we've heard so far, um, I feel that, you know, given the current um, situation of the world, um, it could be a little bit um, you know, concerning uh, how, how is it going to be in a few months and uh, where are we going to land, sort of. But um, this is also a great opportunity to, um, you know, like we've discussed earlier, take on projects and work on them. There is uh, no one breathing down your neck. There are no time constraints. So this is a good time to learn and um, learn all the hard stuff. Um, there's plenty of uh, data. Data is everywhere these days, and also volunteer opportunities um, to work on uh, projects, even related to COVID. Um, so if you look for them, you will find them. So this is a, you know, use this in, in a you know opportunistic way, and and learn from this, and you know, um, a network, network with the people that you know or um, you know you find interesting so you can learn from them as well. And to add on to that, okay. sorry, um, to add on to that, I guess everyone touched on this point kind of a little bit, but what I would emphasize on is the idea of stepping out of your comfort zone. This uh, relates to communication, soft skills, as well as your project, right? Um, you have this, COVID-19 situation where you might have a little more time to emphasize your own skill. How do you present your story to your empl uh, future employer? Like, how do you make your story interesting? How do you show a, a start to end process that shows your creativity and shows how you progress through difficulties? I think those are very important. And that, honestly, to me, that comes down to stepping out of your comfort zone and making connection with people who actually will care about the stories that you make. You have to actually go out there and initiate this kind of, these kind of connections. So yeah, um, really stepping out of your comfort zone is what I would recommend. Yeah, I, I would echo that um, completely. Um, I, think, I think the end goal is really to find something that you're passionate about. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be your absolute number one passion, but it just, you know, you're kind of swinging along through life and uh, you just need to grab on the next branch. So you need to find something that moves you in the direction that you want to be heading in. And the best way to do that is to know 
what the universe of possibility is. Um, so the best way to, to, to know what that universe is is just to get your, your toes wet, you know, in, in every kind of area that you can get your hands on. Um, and I think it's Google who, who looks for uh, T-shaped uh, employees. I, th I think it's Google. Um, and the idea is that rather than being an expert in everything or an expert in nothing, the idea is that you're an expert in just a few skills, which is the pointy part of the T, and then, you know, you have ex some experience in a bunch of other areas. Um, so I think, for me at least, uh, I use DataCamp to get started, and, and that just kind of helped me learn a bunch of different areas and programming languages. Um, and then a lot of it was just going on my own and starting projects. And, you know, if something didn't seem right, oh, man, this doesn't seem right for Excel. Like, <laughs> this, I should not be doing this in a spreadsheet. Then maybe, you know, look into R or maybe you've got some huge data set and uh, you want to figure out how you, how you want to store it. Um, so just kind of being creative and innovative and just coming up with new ideas. Um, another one other last uh, thing that I I usually recommend is to go on LinkedIn, go on Indeed, go on job search websites, and just look through the data roles or or roles that you're sort of interested in. Look at what they're uh, looking for. See if you if you have what it takes, and and if if you don't have it, fill in the gaps. And it doesn't even require taking a class. If if they have some programming language you're not familiar with. Most of the time, they're not looking for, especially if it's something um, outside of the R, Python, SQL world, a lot of times they're not looking for super experienced people. They're just looking for people who are aware of what it is and know how to problem solve. Um, so I think constantly kind of looking that up, figuring out where your gaps are, and filling that in. Um, Thank you, and we're gonna we're gonna end strong with Stephanie here. Um, so my closing advice, both in general and especially during this time, is be kind to yourself. Um, working on a personal project, especially if your internship was revoked, is tough under normal circumstances to to stay focused. Um, it's extra tough now with everything else that going on and that's going on in the world. So. Be kind to yourself. Um, you are going to fail in your projects. Data science has a lot of failure and things not working. Don't take it personally. It has nothing to do with you personally. Um, it's learning to develop that ability to say, well, this didn't work. That's fine. I'm going to try something else. Or this data just doesn't match this model. This model is not the right method. I don't know what I'm doing. Like that can spiral. Be kind to yourself. Of course, you don't know everything. Being a data scientist is a lifelong learning experience. You always have to learn new methods, new tools, new platforms. So if you can approach it with that sense of, I'm going to learn something new, and I'm going to break it down into its component parts, right? Because otherwise, it's this big, massive, big data project where it's so many things that you don't know. Break it down to its component parts, tackle something. And instead of saying, I don't know this, it's, I have a chance to learn something new. And that's a really hard mindset. This is like years of taking it personally when research projects didn't work, speaking to you now. Um, so, so be kind to yourself. And an extra plug for all the students that are affiliated, um, you can always contact me. Um, I am still building up my network within San Diego, but not to brag, like you should contact me. I can be a good contact, right? If you work with me, I can write you letters of recommendation. Um, you can come work with us in the lab and get job experience. So don't overlook kind of the, the connections that you've already made on campus, right? It's great to get out and get internships, but you have a whole network of people on campus who are really invested in your success and we want to help you. And so all it takes is an email and I, I may or may not wake up to like a thousand emails. That's fine. Um, we are here to help. So, so please think of the campus network and the HDSI network and the library as people who are there to, to help um, and be kind to yourself as you become a data scientist. Well, I don't know if there's a way that we could uh, end on any stronger note than that. So thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. Thank you to DS3 for putting in so much work uh, into planning this panel. I'm glad so many of, of you were all able to come out to the event today. Uh, Ayush has a, has a number of things that they're going to use from 
uh, from this panel discussion. And there's, I believe there's going to be some sort of article that they're going, that you guys are going to be developing. So uh, we're also going to be sending DS3 uh, the video from today's panel. So if somebody uh, missed it or somebody would like to re-listen to all the great uh, advice that was in this panel, you'll be able to do that here in the next couple days. But once again, thank you so much panelists. Thank you so much DS3 for joining us. Today's event was great and we're looking forward to doing more events like this with you in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you panelists. Thank you. Thank you.